Today's my wife's birthday, by the way. Um, are you going to sing for us again? Okay. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Stephanie. Happy birthday to you. You know, um, I want to thank you for those of you who um, have been acknowledging the degree I received yesterday, but I want to bring to your attention that my wife also received a degree. She received her PhD. PhD is for putting hubby through. So she deserves a round of applause for her. All her work. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Well, we're starting a new series I mentioned earlier on the Minor Prophets. And let me assure you, these books of the Old Testament, these last 12 books in your Old Testament, are not called minor because of how unimportant they are. Uh, the minor prophets are of major importance. The only reason we call them minor is because they're shorter in length than the major prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. But these prophets uh, spoke about things that we need to hear today. They are very practical and relevant for Christians today. They are full of insightful messages, lessons, and principles for us today. They contain prophecies and promises of the coming Messiah and the church and the gospel. And these prophecies build up our faith and help us to live out our Christianity in difficult times, such as the times we live in today. And we need to remember that the message of the gospel of first importance, it's, it's, it can be seen in every book of the Bible, even in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is the unifying theme of all 66 books of the Bible. We read in 1 Corinthians 15 that the gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sin according to the scriptures. And when Paul says according to the scriptures, he's talking about the Old Testament. And that Jesus Christ was buried and that he rose from the dead according to the scriptures. Again, that's talking about what the Old Testament said about Jesus. And we also see in 1 Corinthians 15 that Paul says that this gospel is of first importance. It, it, that, that gospel, we stand and we are saved if we hold on to it firmly. So these, uh, these books of Old Testament prophecy, even these minor prophets give us this, this good news of the gospel. And we need to study those passages and hold on firmly to this good news of the and resurrection of Jesus for our salvation. Throughout his ministry, Jesus Christ referred to the Old Testament scriptures as books that were written about him. We celebrated Easter last Sunday. We talked about uh, several different passages. Several people read uh, accounts from the gospels concerning the resurrection of Jesus. One of those accounts was Luke chapter 24. And in that passage, we're told about two disciples who were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus after the resurrection. And Jesus appeared to them. He didn't reveal his identity, though. His identity was hidden until uh, the, the bread when he was revealed to them. But along that walk, Jesus was having a Bible study with them. They had shared how they were discouraged and confused and sad because Jesus, their, their Lord, had been crucified and put to death. And, and, and then they heard this, uh, this uh, account that uh, the tomb was empty, and they didn't know what that meant. And this is what Jesus said, How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, even the minor prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. You see, in all the prophets, even the minor prophets, we see prophecies, illustrations, and principles that point us to Jesus. So as we read the minor prophets, as we study these 12 books over the next 15 weeks, prayer that Jesus would guide us like he guided those two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And that God would open our eyes just as he opened the eyes of those disciples as they broke bread with Jesus. That God would help us to see Jesus in these books 
of prophecy. We're going to start the book of Hosea today. And Hosea is not the first minor prophet chronologically, but it's the first in our English Bibles, probably because it's the longest of the minor prophets. It has 14 chapters. So we'll spend a couple of weeks in Hosea. Hosea was a prophet. He lived about 750 years past. And at that time, God's people were divided into two different nations. There was the northern kingdom of Israel, that was the ten northern tribes, and they were uh, throughout their history led by pagan kings and queens, and they were constantly in idolatry and turning away from God. Then there was the southern kingdom of Judah, and that was mainly the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. They had the temple, they had Jerusalem, and they had some good kings and some bad kings. Uh, but at this time, uh, in the time of Hosea, Judah had a good king and had a bad king. And that's kind of the direction that the nations were going. And God commanded Hosea to preach to this northern kingdom of Israel and to preach about God's coming judgment. It would be just a, a few years after Hosea's time that Assyria, the empire of Assyria, would come in and destroy Israel. One of the main ways we see the gospel in the book of Hosea is through Hosea's family. He had three children, and uh, perhaps you've heard the stereotypical remarks about the preacher's kids, you know, uh, how they are always rebellious, got a bad reputation. Well, Hosea's children, I mean, they, they had a bad reputation, got the chance to earn a bad reputation. God commanded Hosea to name his children after the coming judgments of God. The northern kingdom of Israel was steeped in idolatry and injustice and all kinds of immorality. And God commanded Hosea to preach those sins and warn the people of Israel about God's coming judgment. And then on top of that, God told Hosea to marry a prostitute to illustrate the, the relationship between God and the people of Israel uh, being unfaithful. And then on top of that, God told Hosea to name his coming judgments of God against Israel's sin. Can you imagine living in a family like that? Your, your, your dad is a preacher preaching an unpopular message. Your mother is a prostitute, and you and all your siblings are named after the coming judgments of God. That might sound like family, and it was. It was a dysfunctional family. We might think that, oh man, there's no way that God could use this family, this messed up family, for anything good. But you know what? Throughout Scripture, we see a lot of dysfunctional families that God is using in amazing ways. I mean, that is the grace of God. That is the gospel. God takes us, regardless of our background, regardless of our reputation, regardless of our dysfunctional families that we're a part of, and he uses us in amazing ways. He gives us a new identity. He gives us purpose. He gives us meaning in life. And he gives us a future through Jesus Christ. God reached out to us. He loved us. He, he took us out of those dysfunctional situations. He took away our, our bad names, our bad reputations, and he gave us a new future. He adopted us into his family. He transformed us into his glorious kingdom. And that's what the book of Hosea. Let's take a look at Hosea's dysfunctional family and see how it gives us a picture of the gospel. Today we're going to focus on his children, his three children. Next week we'll talk about his marriage. And his first child was named Jezreel. Jezreel means God scattered, is what Hosea 1, 2 through 5 says. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go take to yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness, because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. So he married Gomer, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel. I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel, and in that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. That was a prophecy of an Assyrian army. They would come in 722 B.C. and destroy the nation of Israel. They would take thousands of Israelites into captivity and relocate them all over the world. And God could have punished Israel 
Israel in a lot of other ways, but he chose to scatter his people, kind of punishment for a reason, not just as a punishment for sin, but for a fulfillment of his redemptive plan in the message of the gospel. This would have a profound impact not only on the people of Hosea's day, but even on people today. You see, Jezreel means God scatters, but it all lands. It's a picture of a farmer throwing seed out into a field, and he's scattering seed all over. But in that same process, he's also planting seed. And that's what God was doing. Uh, the, the Assyrians would take these Israelites, these Jews, into captivity and relocate them at different places. And in that time of caste, networks of Jewish communities and synagogues would develop in the Gentile world. And that was part of God's plan, to have this network of Jewish communities all over the Gentile world to be staging locations for the message of the gospel after Christ developed and established the church. In the Great Commission, Jesus told his disciples to go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. That was able to happen because of this dispersion of the Jews during the Assyrian captivity. So what does that mean for Christians today? Well, God is still in the business of scatter. Sometimes God will scatter us. Sometimes God will, will cause things to happen in our lives that will turn our social world upside down. We'll find ourselves at a different job. We'll find ourselves at a different school. We'll find ourselves in a different neighborhood, maybe even a different city or state or maybe even in a different country. People that we would encounter every day, familiar faces are no longer in our lives. And there's a whole new set of faces that we have to get to know, a whole new set of names that we have to get to know. That may be a result of discipline designed to teach us to hope and trust in God and depend on him for help. God wants us to take our faith to a new group of people. Maybe there's some people that God wants us to meet and get to know and share the gospel with. You know, in the early church, there were many times when Christians were scattered because of persecution. In Acts 10, great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And then in verse 4 it says, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. You see, those Christians in the first century, they, they knew that they were going to be persecuted. They were going to be scattered. They are going to find themselves in unfamiliar situations. But every time they did, they saw it as an opportunity to share the gospel with someone new. And that's what we need to do. We need to look for those opportunities, even in difficult times when we're surrounded by unfamiliar faces. See that as an opportunity for God to work in someone's life. We also see from the name Jezreel that we need to expand the kingdom of God. We need to recognize that the Great Commission was not just for the early church. It was not just for the people of the first century, but it's also for us. Jesus gave the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 4 and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Notice he gives a promise with this command that extends to the very end of the age, the very end he's talking about until he returns again. And so this command is an ongoing command for every century and every culture. Christians throughout history are given this command and the promise that comes with it that Jesus is with us to help us carry out the Great Commission. We need God is giving to us to expand his kingdom. Let's talk about Hosea's second child. Hosea had a daughter, and her name was Loruhamah. Loruhamah means unloved. What a sad name for a daughter. This a little girl named unloved. Can you imagine? Gomer conceived again. She gave birth to a daughter. The Lord said to Hosea, Call her Loruhamah. For I will no longer show love to the house of Israel, that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to the house of Judah, by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses or horsemen, but by the Lord their God. So this daughter was named unloved. 
And it was meant to illustrate the contrast between that northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Israel had rejected, they had gone after idols and false gods of the pagans. So God removed his love from that nation, but Judah put their trust in Yahweh as the one true God. And God predicted that Judah would be saved by a miracle, not by sword, not by bow, not by any human army, but God would save them by And that's exactly what happened. Israel was destroyed by the Assyrian army. They came through in 722 and completely wiped them out. Assyria came down south into Judah and started destroying cities. But at that time, King Hezekiah uh, took counsel with Isaiah. Isaiah was the prophet in the south, the advisor, the chief advisor of King Hezekiah. And uh, he found stability and assurance in the promises of the Lord through the prophecies, through the preaching of Isaiah. And so he, he came into the temple and he, he brought this letter from the king of us and he read this to the Lord and said, Lord, help us. And he prayed fervently. He had all the people in Jerusalem praying and they turned to the Lord and God did bring about a miraculous deliverance. He killed in one night 185,000 Assyrian soldiers, not by sword, not by bow, not by any human armies. They it was a fulfillment of what Hosea prophesied here in Hosea chapter 1. It's important for us to recognize that God would show love to the northern kingdom of Israel. And uh, it would be in his timing. Later we'll find Dick's that, that God was planning a, a restoration of his people and that he would again show love to Israel after they return to him in humble repentance. So what does that mean for Christians today? Well, it means that in Christ we are loved. We need to remember that God. Before we came to Christ, we were living for ourselves. We were ignoring God's word. We were rebelling against him. Before we came to Christ, our sins separated us from God. And that's what happened to Israel. They, they turned away from the Lord and their sins separated them from God. But it's only by coming back to the Lord and acknowledging what Christ has done for us at the cross, being baptized into his death, buried with him, and raised to walk in newness of life. That's when we receive this new promise of restoration. And that's what we look forward to in Christ. Uh, 5, 8 through 10, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more shall we be saved through his life? Uh, The the gospel is this message, not only of the death of Christ, but also of the resurrection of Christ. And that's what baptism represents. We, We are united with Christ into his death, and then we are also united with Christ in his resurrection. We come to life because of... Judah was saved from the wrath of God by a miracle that took place outside the gates of Jerusalem. So we too are saved by a miracle that took place outside the gates of Jerusalem the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Those are the miracles that bring us, setting us into the love of God. Another thing we can learn from Lo Ruhamah is that we need to love the unloved. God knows that people need to be loved. And God wants to show his love to people, not only through Jesus Christ, but also through his church. And he's calling us to to bring this message of the gospel to the people in our world, even those people that are unlovable, even those people that we might not want to love. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus called us to love the unloved. In the Sermon on the Mount, he even calls us to love our enemies. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And if you've ever been betrayed or hurt by someone that you trusted, if someone in your world has hurt you or or how difficult this is, you know how uh, virtually impossible it is to show forgiveness and love to people who have betrayed you, people you trusted, 
We, that's not our natural tendencies. We cannot do that by our own power. We need God living in us to accomplish that kind of love. And when we think about the God at the cross, I'm so thankful, Dave, for that, uh, that picture you gave us of what Jesus went through in, in the garden. When we really think about that, what Jesus went through, he went through separation between him and his Father in heaven for us. The gospel to sink into our heart. That's when the Holy Spirit changes us and motivates us and inspires us and empowers us to show that same kind of love to others. We need to love those who are unloved. Let's talk about Hosea's third child, Loami. Loami means not my people. After she had weaned Loruhamah, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Loami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Can you imagine living in this family? Ah, oh, looks to God whenever Gomer would call her children in for dinner, you know? Scattered, unloved, not my people. Dinner time. And this was just a constant sermon illustration reminding all the people in the, neighbor, in the neighborhood that this is where Israel is in their relationship with God, the one true God, Yahweh. They are scattered. They have no stability. They are lost. They are unloved. They're not receiving the love God wants them to have because they've rejected him. And they're not his people. They're following Baal and all these other gods. They're not God's people. Family would be a constant reminder to the people of Israel that because they rejected Yahweh, God had rejected them. But God would not leave them forever. In the very next two verses, I love this, God gives this prediction of restoration, this prediction of the time when Israel would return and be his people. He says, yet the Israelites will be like the sand of the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called the sons of the living God. The people of Judah and the one leader and will come up out of the land for great will be the day of Jezreel. Hosea predicted a time when the Israelites would return from captivity and be blessed by God as, as his people. And he predicted a time when the two nations, the united as one nation with one king, and they would be blessed and they would prosper being faithful to the Lord as the one true God. So what does that mean for Christians today? Well, first of all, in Christ, we are the children of God. God knows that people need to be loved. They need to belong. They need to be needed. And because of Jesus, we have been adopted into the family of God. We belong. We have stability. We are needed as part of God's family. And we have this new identity, this new purpose, this new connection with our brothers and sisters that give us the New Testament, Peter takes this prophecy from Hosea and apply, he applies it to us as Christians today. Regardless of where we came from, we come to Christ and we become part of God's family. We become children of God and he gives us a new purpose and a new identity. He says in 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. We're not scattered. We're not in love. We're, we're not uh, without a family. We're no longer not my people. Now we are the very people of God. That you may declare you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In Christ, we are the chosen people. We are the royal priesthood. We are the holy nation. We are those belonging to God with a purpose. in the family of God. We're children of God. And we have a divine purpose. We also see from this third child, Loami, that we need to invite people into the family of God. God says this. 
And this is, a, this is the prophecy that I referred to earlier where, where God shows the total reversal of these three children. He, he takes away their old name and he gives them a new name. And this is really a prophecy of what's going to happen with Israel when she repents and comes back to God. And we have in Christ. He says, I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called not my loved one. I will say to those called not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. Those names, all three of those reputations, instead of being scattered, now I'm going to plant you in my own land. Instead of being unloved, I, I will show love to you. In, in, instead of being not my people, no, you are my people. God has planted us world today because he wants them to be a part of his forever family. And he's counting on us to invite the people in our world around us into God's family. He wants to speak through us to these people who are hurting in our world. He wants us to reach out to those unwanted. You see, there's a lot of people in our world today who are feeling just like Hosea's children. They feel scattered, they feel unloved, and they feel unwanted. And that's why God placed the church here in this community who are going through these struggles and these problems. We live in a world full of hurting people, desperately looking for hope and love. But you know, right here in this community in Vancouver, in this part of Vancouver, we see a lot of families that are struggling just to get by. And they're feeling scattered. We see parents who are split apart, parents who are not showing them the love that they need. We see teenagers without direction, without good adult role models in their life, turning to crime and drugs and immorality. They need the church. They need the gospel. They need Jesus. I firmly believe God has planted many ha ha Church of Christ here for this community. Now they need us. They need Jesus. God wants to work through us to invite these people into his family. We are that message of the God from these names of Hosea's children, we see many of the same struggles taking place in the world today and in our community today. And we also see how the gospel is the answer to these names that have been given to these children in our community. I feel like one of Hosea's children. Maybe you feel scattered uh, away from family and friends, uh, away from God. Maybe you need this message of the gospel in your life. Maybe you feel unloved, alone, unwanted, in need of God's mercy and love. God is inviting you to accept Christ. You feel separated from God. Our sins do separate us from God. Do you ever feel like you don't really belong anywhere? Do you ever feel like you're just tired of drifting through life without a purpose? God has given us, in Christ, a new identity and a new purpose. In Christ, his new creation, the old has gone and the new has come. Let's bring this message to our community. And if you have not received it, this is an invitation for you. As the praise team comes and prepares to lead us in a closing song, think about your relationship with God. If you're new to this relationship with God, for all eternity, God wants to be your loving father. He wants to give you a new identity, a new purpose. And you can have that freedom and redemption by putting your faith in Christ, turning away from sin and being baptized into Christ. And if you are a Christian, just think about what we have. As, as 1 Peter 2 says, recognize that we are a, a chosen people, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation belonging to God with a purpose of declaring the excellencies of God. When we really think about what Christ has done for us, how can we not? 
that even today. Let's stand. We're going to have a, a prayer before we sing this final song. God, we are so thankful for the message of the gospel, this message that gives us a new name, a new reputation, a new purpose, a new identity. We're so thankful for what Christ was willing to have, this new identity. And God, we're so thankful that we are loved in Christ and that we do have uh, this, this new purpose in life that is meaningful. And God, that you've entrusted us and, and partnered with us to share this message with people in our life here in Minnesota. Help us be your hands and your feet and, and your message of good news to the people here in this community. Help us to reach out with the love of Christ and the truth of your word. And God, make a difference through us, we pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.